our lives, with our devotion, with our whole heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to take uh, your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the book of Colossians. We are continuing uh, our study in the book of Colossians called Impact, where we're looking at uh, how God will impact our lives and how we can impact our world in the name of Christ. If you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, there's Bibles in the pews around you. Feel free to grab one of those and use it. If you need a Bible, just take it. Uh, we would love for you to have the Word of God and use the Word of God and let it change your life. Hey, as we get started, let's do a, a little bit of confessing to start the service. Shouldn't be so scary after all these kids have confessed their faith in Christ. Um, so uh, let's do a little bit of confessing because I want to discuss distracted driving. Oh, look, all the teenagers right in front of me, too. I'm going to talk about distracted driving. Um, you know, it's all the rage. Lots of people are talking about distracted driving. There's all kinds of statistics out there. And we all know that if you make a habit of driving distracted, what's going to happen? Yeah, you're going you're to crash, right? You're going you're gonna to hurt yourself, hurt others. It's not going to end well. So uh, how many of you drove distracted this last week? Okay, lots of hands went up. I, 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 I impressed. A lot of you didn't raise your hands, though. So... Um, Maybe we need to go ahead and, and go by the definition of distracting behaviors per the insurance industry. The auto insurance industry lists behaviors that are contributing factors to accidents. This is what they call distracted driving. So if you text or talk on your phone while driving, they consider that distracted driving. Hmm. Anybody talk on their phones last week while they were driving? We won't even ask the text question. Hey, did you know it's considered distracted driving if you smoke, eat, or drink non-alcoholic beverages while driving? Yeah, that's Starbucks. <laughs> they consider that a distraction. You consider that a comfort to your soul. <laughs> they consider that wrong. Hey, did you know it's considered a distraction if you look at people or objects along the way? Did anybody notice other people, you know, stuff on the side of the road while you're driving? That's a distraction. If you have pets or people in the car with you, it is considered a distraction. Hey, I didn't make this up. I just pulled it off the, the internet, right? Off their website. If you operate the air conditioning or the audio or GPS while you're driving, that's distracted driving. By their definition, I know none of you, if you forgot to turn the AC on when you started the car, <laughs> turned it on while you were driving. Here's the best one, though. I couldn't believe this was considered distracted driving. They said, and this is the number one cause of distracted driving accidents, according to the auto insurance industry. If you zone out <laughs> while you're driving, it is considered distracted driving. They must have never driven from here to Vegas, right? <laughs> so, okay, so let's do this again. Uh, let's confess again. How many of you drove distracted in the last week? Yeah, if you drove, you drove distracted according to the uh, Ins Auto Insurance Institute. Um, now, we know we're, we're laughing at this, but the truth is if you really do drive distracted all the time, it's not going to end well, okay? You're going to crash. You're going to burn. And I want you to know that if you make a habit of living distracted, your life is going to end in ruins as well. Colossians chapter 3, first four verses. Listen to the Apostle Paul. Let these words burn into your soul. He says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. The Apostle Paul is very clear that a life of impact is a life that is focused, specifically focused on the person of Jesus Christ. To live any other way, he says, is really a distraction from following Christ. And we get so distracted with life, don't we? We're not even talking about bad things. we got to pay the bills. 
We gotta take care of our family. We, we've gotta go to work. We need to hang out with friends and have some downtime, right? We gotta take care of our kids. And you know, we gotta take them to Disneyland. And we gotta run them to baseball and cheerleading and everything else they gotta get to. Oh yeah, and we gotta make it to church. Gotta do that God stuff. And yet throughout the Bible, we are encouraged to lay aside the distractions and focus on Christ. That's so what Jesus said in Matthew 6, right? Don't worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. Uh, but instead, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added to you. It's what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1.21 when he said, For to me, to live is Christ. To die is improvement. How about the Apostle John, 1 John 2.15, where he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world, because if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So we want to live lives of significance. We want to live lives of impact that are powerful. How do we do that? How do we deal with the distractions? Well, one answer given down through the ages is, you, you know, you swear off everything else in the world, you join a you know, monastery, and you go up on a mountain and pray. You know? Or if you're the youth and you just go at youth camp, right? It was really easy to focus on Jesus at youth camp, wasn't it? Because you're there and, and you just, some of you, you just want to live at youth camp all the time. Yeah, it'd be easier to follow Jesus that way, we think. Nobody's willing to keep you there all the time. Though. That's the problem. <laughs> See, it's really easy to follow Jesus on the mountaintop, but you come home, you come down, you live life. And, and, and none of us, because you're here, are the kind that are going to just like say, I'm going up on the mountain and staying there all the time. Uh, and that's not what Paul wants us to do. That's not what he's teaching. He's writing to a church that's in the middle of a city. He's not writing to people who are monks that are living someplace separated from the world. He's writing to people who have a real life. And he says, hey, we need to focus on Christ. Set your mind on Christ. So how do we do this? How do we live a focused life as followers of Jesus? Well, I think Paul wants us to know that to live a focused life, our lives are connected to Christ. Our lives are connected to Christ. Did you catch that? Verses 3 and 4. He says, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. What's he talking about? Well, when these students made their confession of faith in baptism, Chad thrust them down quite forcefully <laughs> into the water. And going down into the water is a picture of death. And burial. And what you're saying is that you died to your former self, your, your self centered, God rebelling person that you were. And as you came up out of the water, it's a picture of being resurrected with Jesus. And now you're a new person and now you're committed to following Jesus. You have died to your old way of life. And now your life is wrapped up in, connected with part of Jesus. He is your life. He is the one who gives you life. After all, he's the way, the truth, and the life. And so now your life is, is forever connected with Christ, and he is the source of our lives. So we died to this old life, and our lives are with Jesus. Well, by the way, Jesus is hidden. Okay, He ascended to the Father, and he's getting ready for a grand entrance. He's coming again. But notice this. The first word in this entire paragraph is what? If, if, if then you have been raised with Christ. That is a significant word. If you have experienced a life-changing encounter with Jesus, if you have confessed with your mouth Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, if you've been raised with Christ, this is big. Because I don't know if you have, only you know if you've made that commitment to follow Jesus Christ with your life. You see, I can't look into your heart. I can't tell if you really are committed to Jesus Christ. And guess what? You can't tell if I am. Only I know what's in my heart. Only I know that I've surrendered completely to Jesus. Only I know that I've said, Christ, you're my king, you're my Lord. I want to follow you and I want you to be my life. See, it doesn't happen because you attend church. It doesn't happen because you get baptized or take communion. It doesn't happen because you live a good moral life. It doesn't happen because you give money to the church. 
See, it happens when you yield your life to Jesus. And nothing else makes that happen. See, if you're going to live a life of significance, a life of impact, it begins if you have surrendered to Christ. If you've been raised up and you know that he has changed you. Do you know that tonight? I pray that you do. If you're not sure, then please see one of us after the service. Let us talk with you. Let us pray with you. Let us help you to be certain that you've crossed that line from if to yes. I know that I have. So if then you've been raised with Christ, then know that as you follow Jesus, that real life is what happens next. Real life is what happens next. Did you catch that? For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, returns, then you will also appear with him in glory. Now that's really kind of confusing, but it's also really kind of cool when you understand it. He says, when Jesus appears. Now this is key to a focused life. So if you really want to live a focused life on Christ, then you got to understand this next point. Uh, you got to believe that Jesus is going to return. See, he, you know, we, we confess that he's Lord. We believe that he died on the cross for our sins, was raised from the dead. And, and, and you also got to believe he's coming again. That one day Jesus is going to return to this world and he's going to conclude history as we know it. And Jesus is going to usher in his kingdom. And scripture says when Jesus, who is our life, appears, guess what? Our real life appears with Jesus. That's when we're going to know the very best of life that Jesus offers to us who are his followers if we know Jesus as Savior. And with Jesus will be our home and our lives forever and ever. Amen. And so many people get distracted from this truth because they get so caught up in when is it going to happen and what are the signs of the times and how are we going to know and what are we going to have to go through. And, and that's not the concern of Scripture. The concern of Scripture is this, be ready for Jesus to come back and be living, understanding that the real life is what happens next. Real life is what happens next. You see, when you have this reality in your heart, and it allows you, it really it compels you to live differently. It compels us to live with hope, with peace, even joy, regardless of the circumstances around us. See, understanding that real life is what happens next is what changes our attitude as Christ followers and allows Jesus to trust with now because we know he's got next. See, here's how I understand it. Maybe this will make sense to you. Um, right now, we are living in the previews. Okay? We're living in the previews. Anybody ever gone to a movie? Let me see. If you've ever gone to a movie. Good. Good. I don't see any, anybody didn't raise their hands. If not, then see me afterwards. We'll take you to the movies sometime, okay? <laughs> Obviously, you live a deprived life, and uh, we'll, we'll figure out something to go see, okay? But, but you've been to the movies, and, and you and your friends, you go to the movies. You and your family, you go to the movies. You go to see a movie, and before the movie that you paid money to go see comes on, what do they show you? Previews. previews. Do you guys like the previews? Yeah, yeah sometimes, right? Because some of the previews are really cool, right? Some of them are just selling you on a bad movie and everything good's in the preview. Some of the previews are like, wow, I can't wait till that comes out, right? You're just, you're out. But, but does anybody ever just like, okay, the previews are done, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving now? No, because you don't pay to go see the previews. You're not there for the previews. You are there for what? The main attraction. Now, have you ever been watching the previews and they have so many of the stinking things that by the time they're done, not only do you have to go to the bathroom again, but, uh, <laughs> but you forgot what movie you came to see? <laughs> Ever happened to anyone else or is it just me? Yeah, see, you know what that is? That's distraction. Right? That's, what that, that's distraction. You're like, wait, what are we seeing? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're living in the previews. This life is the preview. Did, wait, did you get that? This life is not what it's all about. This world right now, this moment this, that we're living in is like the previews because the previews are like this long and the movie's like this long. 
And this life, if you live a long one, is like 80, 90 years. And, and, and compared to eternity, it's less than this. We're living in the previews. The main event is still to come, and it's wrapped up in Jesus. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus guarantees you front row seats to the main event. The best seats in the house to the main event. And the main attraction is ahead of us. And this life is just the previews. And so if you love the previews, great. But if the previews stink, if they're horrible, guess what? It's only a little while, and the main event is still to come. See, the, the, the good stuff is still to come. This is not what we're here for. We're here for the main event, and we're following Jesus now because he saved us from our sins, and he's given us eternal life, but he's telling us, hey, don't put your eggs in this basket of now because the real life is next. It's the main event. And we get distracted by focusing on all the stuff that's happening right now and we get all worried about right now and about tomorrow and we don't know and, and all this kind of stuff. And here's where the freedom in Christ lies when we really live understanding that the main event is what we're living for. See, that's what sets us free. That's what gives us the courage to look at life and go, hey, you know, do your best, do your worst. It's not gonna matter. If I fail, if I struggle, if you hurt me, guess what? Main event. It's ahead of me. You can't take that away. This is the preview. If, if the preview is no good, it's only for this long. That's what the Apostle Paul said. I, I don't consider these present sufferings worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. And, and it's not saying give up on this life. This doesn't mean that you detach and you stop living here. What it means is that you live fully today because you don't have to fear what's going on. You don't, you don't have to be wrapped up in depression about, oh, I'm not good enough and I failed and all that kind of stuff because God's grace is enough and the main event is what's guaranteed. And, and you don't have to worry about the betrayal and the hurt and the pain and the sorrow and all that stuff that's for the moment because it's all going to get washed away. When Jesus, who is our life, appears, then our lives are revealed. And, and we get to experience next. But see, when you... When you understand that, when you grasp this, it changes your dynamics about how you live your life. It releases the stress because you don't have to be perfect. You really don't. Uh, like I told the kids, you're going to drop the beanbags. Sometimes we just lose them. We don't even know where they are. <laughs> That's why grace is so awesome. Because Jesus really will forgive us and pick us up and, and carry us to the main event. He's already promised to do that. It releases the stress. We're, and by the way, let me just go ahead and tell you something. We are broken people living in a broken world filled with other broken people, which means that life is not going to happen the way you want it to. Let me just go, if that's bad news for you, then let me go ahead and be the bearer of bad news. Your life is not going to play out the way that you dreamed and imagined and hoped that it would. It's not. Because you're a sinner in a sinful world and God is going to redeem you and he's going to redeem your life and he's going to redeem these moments but it's not all going to happen the way that you want the script to be. But this is the preview. Here's what's, here's what's really cool is that when the life, this life is over or when Jesus returns, then um, your life is going to be perfect and it's going to be better than you ever imagined. See, that's the main event. And so when we grasp this as followers of Jesus Christ, it changes the way that we relate to this world because now we are people of hope and we are people of peace and we are people of joy and nothing in the preview can take that away. So I hope you understand that our life is connected to Christ and that the real life is what happens next. Now, once you know this truth, it allows us to focus on the things above. Focus on the things above. Isn't that what he says? If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on this earth. Focus on Christ, who is your life. If, if the main attraction is what we're living for, then we need to focus on the person who's going to provide the main attraction, Jesus. How do we do that? What does it mean to seek or to set our mind on the things above? How do we live lives of significance if we're just thinking about heaven all the time? Right? Well, here's three thoughts to help you focus. Because it's not just thinking about heaven all the time. It's thinking about Jesus. 
So here's three thoughts to help you focus. You want to live a focused life. You want to set your mind on the things above. You've got this, this idea that we're connected to Christ and, and real life is next. Then here's three things I want you to, to take home with you tonight. First of all, let the Bible be your guide. The Bible is our guide. All right? Uh, here at Calvary, we believe that the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. It is our guide. Uh, you've got to decide what you're going to believe and, and uh, you're going to decide who you're going to listen to and who's going to be this, the voice of truth in your life. And, and here at Calvary as a church, we've decided that it's this book. Okay? It's the Bible. And, and there's some people who go, well, come on, aren't you smarter than that? Don't you think that? No, I, I, actually, I'm not smarter than that. Can I just tell you something? I decided that God knows more than I do and I'm going to listen to him. And, and my life's a whole lot better because I listen to him. And we believe that your life will be a whole lot better if you listen to him. And so the Bible is our guide. But it's really easy to say that. Uh, but if you don't believe it or if you don't read it, which is basically the same thing, then you can't follow it and experience the blessings that God wants to give you. Let me just put that out again. There's some people who say they don't believe the Bible, so why would they read it? There's other people who say they believe the Bible, but they don't read it. It's the same thing as not believing it. Because if you don't know what it says, then you can't do what it says, and you're going to live a distracted life. So if you want to live a focused life, then you got to pick it up. you got to put it in your life, which is, by the way, why we promote life groups. It's why we promote Bible studies. It's why we give Bibles away, because we want it to be in your life. Because the Bible tells me to love my neighbor, and it defines what loving my neighbor looks like, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. It, it, the Bible tells me how to be a great husband and how to be a good parent. But I got to read it and find that out. The Bible tells me how to run my business so that God will bless me instead of oppose me. Because he's going to do one or the other. Hmm. So if you're running a business, you might want to check it out. I want God to be for my business, not against it. The Bible tells me how to treat people, how to enjoy beauty, how to know God on a deeper level. So to live a focused life means the Bible is your guide. Is the Bible guiding your life? If the answer is no, then you're living distracted and it's going to lead to ruin. Second thing to do to, to live a focused life is to understand that Jesus is our example. Now, I know Jesus is our Savior. He died for our sins. But he also showed us what it means to live a Christian life, a, a, a God-centered life. He, he, he demonstrated a godly, fruitful human life. And, and he showed us what that godly character looks like. And, and it's the way he walked. It's the way he talked. It's the way he healed people. It's the way he responded to criticism. It's the way he faced persecution. It, it's the way he showed compassion to people who were hurting. It's the way he showed grace in surprising moments to people who didn't deserve it. See, Jesus set the example for us. And if we want to be people who say we're followers of Christ, then it means that we need to reflect the character of Christ, which means that we need to follow the example of Jesus. And so many times, I can't even tell you how many times, in churches we do stuff that is far, far, far from what Jesus would do. So don't pattern your life after movie stars or rappers or sports heroes. This may hurt a little bit. Don't even pattern your life after your parents. Pattern your life after Jesus. By the way, you know where you'll find the stories of Jesus? Yeah, in the Bible. How amazing is that? So cool. You know, you know what cracks me up uh, is all these people who want to talk about Jesus but have no idea what he actually did or said. Yeah, I think we should all be like Jesus. Really, do you have any idea what Jesus said? No, no. Well, actually, um, uh, yeah, he told us to love each other. Yeah, he also said that he was the only way to salvation. Are you okay with that? Well, no, I'm sure he didn't mean that. <laughs> yeah, actually, he did. So don't be a fan of Jesus if you're not going to know what he's going to say. You know, most of us in this room have already said, hey, I've decided to follow Jesus as my Savior, as my Lord. You might want to know who you're following. And if you want to uh, read about Jesus, four Gospels have his story, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
Okay, first four books of the New Testament. So find one of those books, camp out there, and read about Jesus. And then imitate him, because you can't go wrong doing that. Thirdly, if you want to live a focused life, then understand that the mission is our joy. The mission is our joy. Uh, Now, pretty much given we all want to be happy. And we all spend lots of energy pursuing happiness and trying to do things that will make us happy. But the best way to achieve sustaining joy in your life is to do what makes heaven happy. Do you know what Jesus said? The only time he ever said it, by the way, uh, will make heaven rejoice. You know what makes heaven rejoice? When a sinner repents. When somebody experiences that life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, then they repent. Just, you know, kind of like heaven was throwing a party tonight with us when we were celebrating these students up in the baptistry. You think we were making noise? I don't know what kind of noise it was in heaven, but it was happy. I mean, and they were celebrating with us. And, and it's so funny because, you know, if you're like me, you grew up in churches where, you know, everybody talked about heaven rejoicing, but they had no idea how to do it themselves. Yes, we're all happy tonight. We're celebrating. (laughs) These fine young people have surrendered their life to Jesus. And we would clap, but somehow we think that's sinful. So, uh, (laughs) and, you know, the only way that we're going to really get this whole joy thing is to understand that the mission is what is going to communicate joy into our hearts. So here at Calvary, we celebrate life change. You probably noticed that. We get excited. We applaud. We shout. Pastor Chet dances and goes all redneck on us going, woohoo! Right? He wasn't even in here to enjoy that. Tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, it'll all resonate even better. So don't give it away. Shh. So why do we do this? Because Jesus came here on a mission, and he said his mission was to seek and to save that which is lost. So if we take this time that we have, this preview, and we focus on joining Jesus in his mission to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ, to seek and to save the lost with him, and then we experience that, see it firsthand in our lives and in others, then we get excited about that. Did you guys notice all the teenagers that were celebrating with their friends tonight? It was awesome. Why were were you guys celebrating with your friends? Because you like to yell? Well, yeah, you do, but uh, (laughs) that wasn't really why you were yelling, right? You were yelling because you were happy for them. You were celebrating with them. See, that's what we do. We celebrate the good news. And and I'm just going to tell you, if you, if you're struggling with joy in your life, Focus your life on the mission of Christ and you'll discover the joy of Christ. Because when heaven is rejoicing and we're rejoicing with heaven, you kind of get happy. You kind of get excited. You kind of go, wow, is this really cool cool or what? Baptized 16 teenagers after camp. Last week after the 4th of July service, we baptized 13 people down in the lake. We got more scheduled for next week. God is good. You know? Yeah. And we just get to be part of the party that heaven is throwing. So when that happens, we just, we're like, all the time around here, we're like, I can't believe that we get to do this. It's so awesome. So you'll find that joy when you get focused on God's mission instead of your agenda. By the way, does your agenda clash with God's mission? Or is your agenda God's mission? Because the mission is the joy. So what's it going to be? A distracted life or a focused life on Christ? One, I guarantee you, will crash and burn at some point. And the other one will impact the world. What are you going to choose? Because Jesus, who loves you, who died for you, who's cheering for you, gave you the choice. Let's pray. Father, what a privilege, what an honor it is to bear your name. Thank you for giving us life. Thank you for giving us life eternal. Thank you that 
this world's just the previews. Because some of us love it and some of us don't. But it's only for a little while until we get to next. So tonight, fill us with joy. Fill us with your presence, with your love and your mercy so that we can walk out of here and share the hope of Jesus Christ with this world. We love you. Thanks for loving us more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God.